over. I'm, I'm Tina Coleman. I'm the staff liaison for the um, Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable, and I'm also an ALA staff. Uh, I'm just sort of facilitating things, so I'm going to turn things over to the GNCRT President Amy Wright, and she's going to be our host and moderator. Take it away, Amy. Hey everyone, um, I also want to give Tina a big thank you. Uh, doing a webinar like this, especially for Freedom to Read Week, bridging the gap between the US and Canada, because y'all, we all fall under ALA. ALA is the accrediting body for library schools in Canada too. So we're really excited to be doing this. And this was the very hard work of Tina and Michelle to put this together. And so we're really excited to get started with this discussion today. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel. Uh, Mariko, I'm gonna start with you. So Mariko Tamaki, is the award-winning writer of many books. Um, most recently, uh, Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me with Rosemary Valero O'Connell, and also This One Summer with Jillian Tamaki. Um, Mariko also writes, I love how you put uh, Heroes, Villains, and Mutants for DC Comics and Marvel, as well as being the editor and curator for the new upcoming imprint from Abrams, which is called Shirley, and that's going to be launching in spring uh, 2021. And that is a new LGBTQIA imprint specifically developed by Abrams to spotlight a variety of graphic novels, fiction, nonfiction, narrative stories. We're super pumped for this, Mariko. <laughs> Um, next on our panel, we have Michelle Arbuckle. Michelle is the co-chair of the Freedom of Expression Committee, which is actually the organizing body behind Freedom to Read Week. Michelle currently is the programming engagement librarian, programming engagement librarian? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry if I, um, at Ryerson University in Toronto. Um, Michelle is currently on leave though from the Ontario Library Association where she is the Director of Programming and Engagement. So Michelle, great thanks as well. Um, Tina and I sort of ambushed Michelle at OLA just a few weeks back and we're like, we have this idea. So um, thank you so much for pulling this together in this such short time. Um, <laughs> next, um, lastly to Angela, which is so cool that you're joining us on this. Angela Okanya is the Director at Large for the American Library Association Intellectual Freedom Roundtable. Um, so the IFRT, we've also partnered on some fantastic tech tattoos. So Angela, thank you so much for being here as well for that. Um, Angela is a Youth Services Supervisor at the Eugene Public Library in Oregon, but I should add she is a former CLA, so California Library Association Teen Librarian of the Year. Um, I also love how you add that you are a comics ranter. Uh, you have your own comics podcast that one <laughs> panel later, which is amazing, and also a secret unicorn. So um, thanks so much, Angela. And so why don't we get started with our panel? So part of the reason we have come together is for Freedom to Read Week. So, oh, I should introduce myself. Sorry, that's pretty terrible. <laughs> um, I knew I was gonna forget something. So I'm Amy Wright. I am the president of the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable. Um, one of the reasons we are actually having this webinar is for as much as comics librarianship has been around for a very long time, I am actually the first president. Um, we are the newest roundtable in the American Library Association. And this is the first time that we've actually had professional designation within librarianship, that comics librarianship is a true sort of sector of our profession. Um, I am the former library manager of my library at NYC School Outreach at the New York Public Library, but currently, sort of like Michelle, I've taken a little bit of a detour. Um, I'm actually a graduate student right now in a public history department at Concordia University in Montreal, and I'm specifically studying uh, censorship out, oh, yeah, Concordia is the best, right? <laughs> um, I'm studying uh, censorship in Canadian libraries, and one of the things that several of us in the comic comic scholar community are finding is that censorship around comics in libraries and schools was far more pervasive than we've talked about, oftentimes in the form of gatekeeping behavior. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about gatekeeping. Um, again, super excited to have this panel, which is also I skipped over my intro slide. Okay, um, we're going to get started. Michelle, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of a history of freedom to read and also how you got involved. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. So we're now in our 36th year of Freedom to Read Week in Canada. And the way that it works is it's actually an umbrella organization under the Book and Periodical Council, which is um, kind of a group that uh, the, the members are from various associations of booksellers, um, editors, various book people, and then also um, the Ontario Library Association and a few other library associations are part of that as well. So that's 
um, how it falls within Canada anyway. So we organize, the Freedom of Expression Committee organizes Freedom to Read Week. It's an annual event. Um, and really it's kind of an outreach advocacy event where we're encouraging Canadians to think about what it means to have intellectual freedom, um, to reaffirm their commitment to that and to understand that freedom of expression is guaranteed to us under our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which I know we'll get into a bit more later about the differences between um, Canada and the US and those freedoms. But um, essentially what we do is we help people who want to be part of Freedom to Read Week or to be part of um, understanding intellectual freedom and what we read by participating in events. They might hold events and we just help promote them across the country. Um, we have held some events in the past. We also spread the word through social media. Instagram seems to be a way to, you know, bookstagram everything. Everyone's um, bookstagramming all the covers of things that they're reading. So there's a lot of movement there and, and people just making amazing displays. The work that goes, I mean, I'm not great at cutting construction paper, but some people are doing some really stellar work out there in terms of what their displays look like. So go take a look at that. Um, but we give educators and schools lots of ideas on things that they can do um, to hold their own events, to talk about it with their students and young people. Um, this is an issue that resonates, you know, obviously quite a bit in schools and I'm happy to see that. Even my own daughter's school, I see they've got a big display up with book covers on there and, you know, kids are always like, what? Harry Potter was banned? And that, that seems to really strike a chord. So uh, we talk about that and what that means. Um, and then of course we put together a kit. So the Freedom to Read kit is something that the committee does together. Um, and it's really an overview of current censorship issues in Canada. Um, there's some provocative news articles in there. We have interviews with various um, champions of freedom of expression. There's some get involved, you know, ways that people can get involved in activities. And then of course we, we create an amazing poster, which if you've seen, um, Recently, we've we've been able to um, collaborate with illustrators and graphic novelists like Jeff Lemire and Jillian Tamaki, and they've done fantastic work. So if you haven't seen the posters before, I highly recommend going and take a look. I have, I, I can't show you, but there is a wall of, of art and it, it's quite spectacular to see it all together. Um, so all that being said, I, I am on that committee. I am part of that committee. I'm the only librarian who sits on that group. Um, and to me, that's an important role to play. Um, I come from the Ontario Library Association. I've been a librarian for about 20 years. And, you know, throughout my career and my schooling, it has been an issue that's been really important to me. Specifically, I've looked at it at the lens of making sure um, or being aware of, of how queer voices are being treated in society and, um, and in libraries and being aware of the ways that we are able to promote those voices or the ways that we implicitly or explicitly silence queer voices and um, and, how, and how freedom of expression um, amplifies or, or hinders that. And so it's an important issue for me. I, like most librarians, I have been grappling with many sides of this issue lately, but um, I sit on a committee that is largely cisgendered white people and um, and I think that, you know, there needs to be a lot, there needs to be more varied perspectives at this table. There needs to be um, voices from our more marginalized communities, communities that we aren't hearing from, communities whose voices are being threatened. And that's really important to me. So I like to bring that perspective, uh, maybe not that perspective to the table, but to ensure that we're thinking about that and, um, and that it's not just a full, um, commitment to free speech, no matter what. So that's kind of where I'm coming at with that. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle, for giving us a background for Freedom to Read. Um, and one of the reasons we asked Mariko to be on um, this webinar, for those of you listening, you may not know, Mariko, beyond being one of the most awarded comics writers currently, is also one of the most banned and challenged. <laughs> um, so uh, even though I knew the background of this one summer, I'm pulling it and I'm like, wow, 
this is book is winning all the awards. But yeah, <laughs> you were um, considered in 2016. Um, this one summer, the book um, that you wrote with Jillian is considered to be the most banned and challenged book in all of North America for 2016. And you tend to top the list still for that. <laughs> <laughs> we um, left the list and then we came back to the list. We were away from the list for a year and then, I don't know, I guess like eight more people complained and we were back on the list. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about prior to 2016, what kind of familiarity did you have around the issues of bans and challenges, things like Freedom to Read Week or Ben Books Week in the U.S.? And post-2016, what were some of sort of the relevant um, revelations for you for your career going forward for this? I mean, I think my, it's funny because I think my original experience of banned books was Alice Monroe, Lives of Girls and Women, which we read in my um, high school. We read for, I think, our grade 11 English class. Um, and our teacher told us that it had been banned. Um, and then I think that that kind of like, we had like our own kind of Lord of the Flies moment in school where some of the girls then felt that it was super inappropriate. And then there was like a, like over oh, Alice Monroe, right? Like if Alice Monroe gets that kind of treatment, then like <laughs> what hope is there for the rest of us? Um, so I knew that, I think the thing that I knew as like a younger person was that sex, sex was the thing that got books banned. Um, and I knew that, um, obviously, I knew that um, in terms of the celluloid closet, I knew the sort of the history of, um, you know, banning any kind of gay content, even like the mention of homosexuality was obviously not something that was included in, you know, I, I thought of it in terms of movies, but I never really thought of it in terms of anything that I would do. Um, I think in part because I came from sort of an outsider perspective, like, you know, my first book was a Canadian indie book that sold 200 copies and most of them to my mother. So I never thought that I was going to be part of any kind of conversation. Um, and this one summer is, I think, the the sort of journey of this one summer in terms of especially its recognition um, from the ALA was a surprise to us. So it was kind of new to be part of that conversation. Um, and then I think when we got the Caldecott Honors and the Prince Honors, um, I think that I felt like it was going to get bigger. Like I felt like the things that I hadn't been concerned about as a writer, because I didn't think about like a mass audience's response to the thing that Julian and I were doing. I got the impression, partly because many librarians came up to me and they were like, this is going to be a thing. <laughs> At the, end, the Caldecott ceremony, many concerned librarians were like, yeah, this is, this is gonna, it's going to happen. Um, and so I was not necessarily um, unprepared for when we ended. I was surprised that we topped the most, um, the most challenged list. Um, and I think the thing that that started for me was like a conversation about, I mean, specifically for me, because it is a conversation about libraries, about how books fit into public spaces. You know, like nobody's saying like, oh, you know, maybe Barnes and Noble is gonna have an issue with this, but like the idea of something being accessible to everybody is where it becomes a conversation. So that kind of, um, that conversation about accessibility and about, you know, like just specifically around libraries for me, like where this book was going to have problems um, was, you know, like a lesson. And I think as a writer specifically, uh, like you have two responses, one is like, you want your books to be accessible. You want everybody to be able to read your books. You don't want, you know, your book to be like hidden under some principal's desk because they think that it's, you know, that there's, you know, a miscarriage in it and that's too much for a 12 year old, which maybe it is, who knows. Um, but I think that I also, it makes me very conscious of the content I was producing and especially creating content for a young adult audience. It made me really think about what it means to be speaking to that audience. And I think maybe a little more vigilant about, like when we wrote, uh, when I was working on Laura Dean, Rosemary and I had conversations about the fact that there was, um, you know, issues of, uh, you know, talking about abortion in a book for teenagers. And I just felt, I felt all the more vigilant about getting it right and about not ceding that space to other arbiters who decide that it's not appropriate. Like, I think it's, it's sort of, you know, on the one hand, you kind of want to ignore it. On the other hand, it's definitely become part of the artistic process for me. 
No, absolutely. And I, I think this is um, for anyone who's listening on the line who hasn't, I would urge you to go to the American Library Association Office of Intellectual Freedom list of banned and challenged books, because you can also see the reasons for why books are banned or challenged. And as Mariko was saying, a lot of times it's for visual depictions, especially of quote unquote serious subject matter. And I think we're going to get into why comics particularly are so banned and challenged, but I think the visual content, absolutely. Um, but before we get going, I just want to make sure, um, Angela, as a representative from the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable, if you wouldn't mind um, telling our listeners a little bit about the work that IFRT does in conjunction with the Office of Intellectual Freedom and also how you came to be involved in this. Yeah, thanks. Um, part of how, I mean, I came to this work was I was a librarian a few years ago, um, about 45 minutes south of San Francisco, which in the States is we thought of as your liberal bastion of things. And I lived in Silicon Valley, which is all about technology. And I lived there my whole life. And I was a teen librarian in a few years, like uh, the Pulse shootings happened um, in a club in Florida. And I worked with a lot of queer youth who said, I don't feel safe going to pride. I feel like I'm gonna get shot. And that's really heart wrenching to hear from kids that you work with. And so I thought, you know what, we need to do something. We need to provide a safe space. That's what we are as libraries. We provide safe spaces. And I thought, let's hold um, a pride event. That doesn't seem too strange. Let's, uh, let's get some pizza. Let's get some glitter. Let's have some fun. Let's make some crafts. We're really good at crafts. Um, and what I realized is that my ideas of what freedom was in this bubble that I lived in were suddenly challenged when men arrived in front of my library with pickets and saying that we were going to have um, transvestites come to our library and we were going to convert the youth. Uh, and I was like, so cool, we're going to eat pizza and like make crafts. So like no converting here. Um, but it really brought to this sense of like intellectual freedom isn't just about the books that we read. It's also about the programs that we hold. It's about the book displays that we put up. It's the content we put on social media, what we do in our schools. There's so much breadth to what intellectual freedom is. And it got me thinking about how do we protect this? How do, if I think that I'm in an open community where everything is accepting and yet I have men on my doorstep um, challenging teens getting into a program, how does that work when you are somewhere where you don't feel that way? So part of what the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable and what the Office of Intellectual Freedom do is they help you. That's the biggest thing we want to do is we want to give you the tools and the resources to let you know what to do next because it's kind of scary when you receive calls from the press, when maybe your director isn't supportive or your community is not supportive. Um, so part of what we do is we keep track of challenged and banned books. Um, we do it anonymously if you want to. Uh, there's a big fear, I think, from some librarians school librarians too, that our jobs are on the line, that if we advocate too hard for a book, if we go up against a parent group, that we are no longer going to be employed. So you can submit these challenges anonymously. Um, so we keep track of all of these things. Most famously, I'm sure most people only come to us because they're like, hey, it's banned book week. It's the one week where we care about things. Um, or when we really talk to the public about what that looks like. Um, so part of that is, you know, gaining general awareness, talking about it, whether it's on social media, via the blogs, um, but giving librarians and staff, any support staff, the tools that they really need to help retain materials um, in their library. That's awesome. And as Angela um, alluded to, one of the places that we hear about bans and challenges the most actually is in school libraries. Um, the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable, we were really happy to partner with the American Association for School Librarians um, this past April, specifically talking about bans and challenges in school libraries, because this happens very often. So why we have, this is a fantastic panel. Can I just say thank you again, all of you for coming together. This is like dream team for me. <laughs> we have like America represented, Canada represented, this is awesome. And also Angela, we're talking about these issues one more day, one more week a year now, freedom to read week. So at least two weeks a year. <laughs> two weeks, we get two weeks guys. Hopefully. Um, so this is a question really for all of the panelists and we've all touched on this, but I was just hoping you could further the discussion around when we talk about intellectual freedom and we talk about freedom to read week, why is this so important, especially now? I mean, for me, it's about agency, right? Like, I think the thing is, and especially, I mean, I've had a lot of conversation with teachers about, especially, you know, I mean, I think 
I think this one summer is sitting under the desk of many principal in many schools all across the United States, which to me is, you know, those lucky principals get like the best books, right? Like by their knees. And that's not really fair. Um, but I do think, you know, it is especially, it's so important in spaces where you are in a supported environment where if you have questions, where if you're not understanding what you're reading, you're actually in the perfect place to discuss these things. You're actually in the perfect place to get into the things that you don't understand or into the things that are overwhelming. And I feel like books is just the perfect medium for that. And the idea of, you know, curtailing those things uh, just feels so uneducational. You know, it just feels like the opposite of what those spaces are for. Uh, and, you know, on a personal level, the idea of removing any, all those books that it represent the experiences of, you know, of queer people, of people of color, of people who, you know, have experienced alcoholism, racism, um, violence in their lives, like all of these things which are, you know, deemed unseemly, just feels, you know, very old timey to me. Like the, I, I think that there are um, a lot of books that, uh, are deemed like too much for people, which sort of erases the experiences of kids whose lives are too much. Um, which, you know, I think I get so many letters or, you know, I get enough letters from people who feel like these books are lifelines. Uh, it's so it feels like, you know, like it's, it's a very emotional reaction I have. I think in the beginning when I would hear about it, I would have this kind of big news like notion of like, if you think you can keep sex and sexuality from teenagers, you're so mistaken. <laughs> like you may be able to take those books away, but they know way more than you do. Um, but I think on like a, you know, on like a more emotional level, it feels really sad to me to think of, you know, like if all you have is like a catch in the rye and a separate piece, like it's not really a portrait of most people's adolescence. Who's going to go? Who's going to go? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll go. I was just going to mention, you know, I'm, I'm seeing this now with my own daughter who's seven and being aware of, um, you know, the, the messages that we put across of what's a good book and what's a bad book. And I was lucky enough, even though I grew up in a small town near Niagara, you know, my, I had uh, my fingertips at the world's largest Daniel Steele collection in my home. But uh, so I was doing book reports on Message from Nam by Daniel Steele in grade seven, and my teacher didn't blink an eye. The historical, you know, it wasn't quite accurate, but, you know, telling a child when they can't read something for whatever reason is really just a surefire way to get them to read it. And what I found growing up was um, accessing work in our library whether it was around what was happening to my body or my sexuality, but being able to go to a space like the library, you know, which was a collection greater than just Daniel Steele works, first of all, great. Um, but being able to access those in a non-judgmental space where someone wasn't hovering over me, I didn't have to go into a reserved book section to get at them or, you know, request access to a locked section of the stacks. I just knew where they were and I could go and grab a book and run over to my favorite corner and, and sit and go through. There were many times where I didn't sign it out because I was afraid that my parents would see it or it would be on our family record or somehow, but I could still go in and read it and have access to it. And I think that's a really important part. That was a huge part of my childhood and, and my teenage years was just knowing that I could go to a space and have access to it, read what I want, and then, you know, go home all the wiser. And, um, and, and really I, I'm, I'm so thankful for that, that experience. Yeah. And I think, as a queer Hispanic woman, like my idea was to try and find myself represented through things that I read in the library. The library was, I'm sure like most of us are second home. And so how do I find these books, but like don't want to have a conversation with my parents about like, cool, I'm gay. <laughs> and that doesn't really work out in our family. Um, but like wanting, like so desperately wanting to find those materials, but knowing that I couldn't like talk to my parents about it and, and not that they weren't supportive eventually, but like that it was this idea that I, I didn't have anything that related to me. And so digging through the library and trying to find books that resonated for me. Um, if some librarian had come and pulled those off the shelf and I never had access to those, like I, I was just trying to understand myself. And so I think when we look at like what 
why it's so important, it's because people want to find themselves reflected in the books that they find at the library and want to find this human connection that somebody else is going through the things that I'm going through, whether it's an alcoholic parent, whether it's your grandma who's on meth, whatever it is, like maybe it's just trying to figure out your sexuality and your gender. Like those books deserve as much of a place. And so I think that's why the conversation is almost in a way like we're recognizing so silly. We're recognizing that people exist of all different walks of life. And so that recognition is this force that's coming into, well, well why are we recognizing these people and, and do they have a place in our society? No, I think those are all really good points that a lot of times the stories that are making people uncomfortable or it's not the stories maybe that are making people uncomfortable, but also what they highlight that as you know, you put it sometimes, uh, Mariko, people going through who have a lot, who are going through a lot of experiences that can be really uncomfortable. And one of the things we talk a lot about, though, when we do Banned Books Week and now for Freedom to Read Week, there's a lot of focus on bans and challenges. And I think most people, when we talk about intellectual freedom, most people can agree, at least in theory, bans and challenges, you know, that is something that certainly is an attack on intellectual freedom. It's a form of censorship. Um, but one of the things we don't talk about, I would argue as much, especially in our profession, is the behavior of gatekeeping. So we see gatekeeping being very persuasive and taking very many forms. Um, one of the ways we hear about it happening a lot of times in school libraries is through restrictive vending agreements. Many times that's something the school librarian can't actually circumvent, but that definitely restricts access. So, um, Michelle, you also mentioned even a form of gatekeeping sometimes in the way we talk about reading. You know, these are good books, these are bad books, and how that perpetuates certain notions of what reading is good reading and what reading kids should stay away from or maybe we, what we shouldn't purchase. So, I was just uh, wondering if the panel can respond to what's your experience been around gatekeeping behaviors that you've either seen or heard about, or maybe ones you didn't even think about as gatekeeping, and then you're like, wait a minute, that is a, <laughs> that's some bureaucratic gatekeeping going on. I mean, I think one of the things that I've spent a lot of time sort of, you know, grappling with lately is just the canon, right? Like what gets taught to kids as, you know, in terms of, especially when you think of the sort of classics that are six, seven, eight, nine, like what are the books that kids read that are considered to be, you know, have been the classics and are still the classics to this day and how those things don't evolve. Like I am always shocked, like even just like I literally had a conversation with like a kid about uh, Catcher in the Rye. And I was like, God, you guys are still reading Catcher in the Rye? Like, that's the book that you guys are given? Like, are we not all like aware now that that's like the seed of toxic masculinity? Like, read it if you want, but like, can we like, you know, read that? And then like, Julia takes a breath, like both of those. I think that that would be really interesting. And I think, you know, it is, you know, in terms of, you know, time spent, part of me feels like the thing that I always want to do as an author is go to ALA and go to, uh, the NCTE, like go to those things just to sort of like try to talk to people about, you know, what is the thing that we're posing for kids is like the bedrock of their literary experience. Like, you know, I think that there's so many things that you can include, but I also know the sort of, you know, the restrictions that are around that. Um, but, uh, you know, even just like, you know, Shakespeare, like no offense to Shakespeare, I know he's not here, but like, I do think that there are so many other um, you know, incredible playwrights out there that that could be included uh, and, you know, and are not. No, and I think that's a great discussion. Like the idea of the canonical texts are themselves an invented history. Um, I was doing some research for my history work and we were talking about the idea of anthologies and oftentimes kids are taught by anthology, but an anthology itself is a created history of a particular thing. And the author was pointing to like 19th century American literature and how actually the best-selling authors in 18th century American literature were female authors. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I think the idea of canonical texts, um, curriculum things assigned over and over again, like those are super um, pervasive gatekeeping that we often don't poke at. Michelle? Right. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to add, and I think one of the things too, like to our, to our sort of, you know, group today is that I think graphic novels are considered to be not literary. Uh, I feel like most of like, you know, well, my Twitter is many things right now, but a lot of it is, you know, a graphic novelist, especially sort of striking back against like, it's super, this is a really great comic. It's obviously, you know, not the same, like, weight as, like, an actual prose novel, but it's, you know, it's pretty good. And having to defend the kind of literariness 
of, of this medium. And I, you know, the fact that something like Persepolis, something like my favorite thing is monsters, which to me are, are as weighty and literary as any prose novels are just, you know, are not, are not considered part of that curriculum. I'm just going to pick up on that a little bit. And I did an interview recently with a parenting magazine and they were asking about, um, you know, not reading books that um, reflect kind of perspectives that we don't hold today. So even a book where there was a, a character's name was Fat Tom or, you know, there's, there's body shaming, there's um, sexuality issues, there's race issues that come up. And, and the parent or the, the journalist saying, you know, should we just be getting rid of these books and not reading them to our children? And my answer was, you know, do what you want if you're a parent. But I think there's a uh, opportunity there, whether you're a parent or whether it's a library group, whether you have um, readers coming in to talk about a work, what an opportunity to to read that work with whatever issue it might have and then talk about what that issue is. So, um, you know, if there's Fat Tom, let's talk about why that's kind of not a great thing to do and why we shouldn't be, you know, judging Tom's body or, um, you know, I just think that there are ways to include work that, um, is considered maybe not appropriate or, or wouldn't be um, high up on our lists today and reflect upon them with a lens of, of where we're coming at it from today. Um, so I think that when questions come from my, uh, you know, the parents council at our school or from, from other people about what should be considered an appropriate work for kids, I think that the better question is how can we have a conversation around this work? It's not, you know, how can we get rid of it? Or it's what, what can we read in, in addition to this that maybe brings a new perspective or, uh, you know, a counterpoint to this work. So that's, that's how I approach most of that in, uh, in the work that I come across. I think part of it too, for gatekeeping is it especially hits our school librarians very hard. Um, I was doing a anonymous survey for this uh, ALA pro project that I was working on and the answers and respondents we got from most school teachers was I won't even buy the material because I think it's going to be challenged or I think that a parenting group is going to come or somebody's going to be upset about it and that there is this sense of I won't even purchase the title because I don't want to deal with what comes afterwards. Um, and that we ourselves as librarians are self-selecting what we choose. And that works for both sides of the aisle. Like I've talked to librarians who tell me they won't buy a Trump book um, just because they don't like him. And it's like when we censor ourselves on both ways, we're no longer giving the public the option. And school librarians have this sense where it's harder because they are seen as, well, I brought this book home from school. And we trust schools um, in a way that we trust libraries, but parents bring their children to the library or they're reviewing their materials. And so school librarians, I think, face this extra challenge of, you know, not having as much funding, say, or as much support from their principals who are hiding their books under their desks and just saying, like, you know, it's, it's easier to just quell this parent, like, just pull the book, don't worry about it. Um, as opposed to, I think, in the public library, we often fight because we're like, rawr, um, and principals come down, and they go, no, rawr, just take it away. Um, so I think that sense of gatekeeping for school librarians is really tough, and, and our own personal judgments get in the way so often. Yeah, I think that part of this really is, and I, I saw there's a question in the feed about sort of like dealing with conflict, like how do you deal, especially now, right, in this current environment, like everywhere, like how do you deal with, you know, with, you know, it's not even, it's much deeper, obviously, than a difference of opinion. How do you deal with things that are in conflict with people's core beliefs or with people's senses of safety? Like, I do think that, um, you know, as somebody who teaches in, uh, in uh, colleges, and I taught at CCA this year, and I had like a, like, you know, the first day of class was, it felt like it was like social work training 101 of like, okay, you guys, this is going to get intense. And we're going to be dealing with, uh, the class was about um, racial representation in comics, especially um, people who write comics uh, about racial identities that they're not a part of, which is almost like saying like, let's fight class 101. Like it was very intense. 
but I said like I, I think that you as an artist should be able to have this conversation so let's figure out the rules for how we're going to talk to each other like basic stuff like I statements but also you know how do you deal with something that is triggering like I give you all the information I can about the books that we're going to talk about and you have to self-select if you think that this is going to be too much for you but that doesn't mean I'm not going to include it in the curriculum like it is about not taking out things and removing things because of for me because it is you know it is intense but it's also like you have absolutely the right to say I don't want to read a book about abuse I don't want to read a book about alcoholism or whatever it is but I also want to sort of keep steering towards ways of actually having a conversation about it as opposed to just like shutting the conversation down by not including those books. No, it's a great question. We had another question building off that from the chat too. What are some good models um, that people have seen? Um, so even you're talking about some having those open discussions, Rico, when you're doing the sessions. Are there some good examples, um, Michelle or Angela, you've seen about sort of navigating that line in the library of exposing people to content, but giving people, you know, the freedom to choose is sort of the reader's choice, but also having a broad spectrum of materials. For me, it's this idea of like, I really believe in um, kids going through and they're going to self-select what they want to read, which I think is a hard concept to tell parents that when your child opens a book, they say, oh gosh, that's no, no, that's not for me, that, that we can have that inherent trust in them sometimes. And that that's something that our conversations I'm constantly building with parents, because kids know, they'll come up and say, hey, I want no kissing or hey, I want a lot of kissing. Um, I'm always like, how much do you like a little kissing? You like a lot of, where are we going with this? And, but they know, and in the librarianship field, I think, especially when we work with youth, we have this sense of sometimes of, we want to protect children, right? We can all, we want to protect children. We want to like, make sure that they're safe. Um, and then when they're teens and adults, we kind of sometimes care less. Um, but this idea that they can be trustworthy, that they know what they want in the same way that they know when a book is too hard because the words are too big, when they open a graphic novel, they know, ooh, that head flew off. This too scary, too scary. They put it down. And and this inherent value that we can trust the children that we work with, that you can trust your own kids, um, is one that I try and talk to parents a lot about. Um, because that's one of the tools that we can give. I, there's all of the other stuff. Like you should definitely have a policy in place for everything, whether it's how you choose books or what happens when they're challenged, even displays that you have or social media content, right? That gives us a good foundation. But a lot of the times it's in this small relationship building that we do in our libraries, in our classrooms every day and work with kids. And I, I think that that relationship building is huge in school libraries where I, you know, I find that for librarians, we talk about intellectual freedom a lot when we're in school and then we get out, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, maybe uh, we're, we're, we're scared of it or we want to pull it out when it's handy, but it's not something that we talk about all the time. I mean, I think particularly in school libraries, it's so important to similar to public libraries, have those policies ready and make sure everyone knows what the policy is. Administration, anyone who's coming to the library, the teachers, even parents, you know, understanding what the role of the library is in that school and how it can benefit their child. Because I often, even as a parent myself, have to remind myself, these parents aren't evil. They're, <laughs> they genuinely have their child's best interest at heart. So figuring out, you know, where they're um, coming from, if they want to have a book removed, or if they want to question why their child has access to it, and then bringing it back to, remember, this is what the library is about. This is what we all agree. And I think, you know, having that open dialogue with them and making sure that we're all on the same page of what the library means to that school is really important when it comes down to making hard decisions like that. And I think the biggest thing is the reason we're all here today is, of course, comics. Um, and if people, our listeners aren't aware, comics remain um, some of the most banned or challenged historically, and they consistently are some of the most gatekeeped material. A lot of libraries do not have um, acquisition plans that can account for comics, especially floppy comics. We hear that a lot when we talk about collection development. Libraries say, well, we can't buy comics because unless they're bound. And my rebuttal always is, well, you have magazines, right? 
Um, you've probably had magazines a long time, newspapers and that kind of stuff too. Like there, there are, there are ways that you could have like a local zine collection or a magazine collection. So, um, one of the things I want to now pose to the panelists is why comics? Like what are some of your thoughts about why they are consistently still so banned and challenged while we're also seeing this amazing, wonderful explosion in comics? And what were some of the things you heard around comics reading growing up? I mean, finally, the, one of the first things I heard about comics was when I was at the ALA in 2008 with Skim, and we had this like lovely, uh, maybe maybe some of you were there, uh, and we had this great dinner with like, our lunch with a bunch of librarians, and like one by one, all these librarians came up to me and were like, "Congratulations, I'm not going to read this." They were like, "The the print is super tiny, and uh, I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to get through this." And we were like, "Cool, cool, cool. Maybe this isn't going to be our career because <laughs> it seems like the librarians don't like it." Um, but I. Um, I do think that it is, you know, it's another way of reading. And I think sort of, you know, it, it is sort of maybe in some ways like a generational thing in terms of like, oh, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I mean, I knew that some librarians were reading it. And I do think like it's changing. Like I, that ALA versus the ALA in 2016 were like two completely different things. And then we were like, mom, buy comics, Ben X. that were like, this is the best. So I think that, you know, there's like a, it's sort of a generation of people who saw it as like, superhero and also to think that superhero stuff can't be serious instead of like you know the sort of like mythology of our of our modern age um so i think that there is i mean i think some of it is sort of like a class thing right like well this is for this is like trash reading this is like you know this is the sort of thing you can buy at your convenience store and you know ergo it can't be anything um serious i do think that um especially like the community that i grew up in in toronto like it, it felt like we had such an incredible literary scene in terms of comics like for me i, I came into the scene with people like jeff lemire who to me is the alice monroe of graphic novels um and i told him that to his face so he knows that's true um but yeah i do i do think that it is um i do think that it is evolving but um i mean also i think you know the 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 face of comics is changing. Like now you have people who are coming out of school and are getting, you know, graphic novel publishing deals, like from the get go, like you have this whole new voice of, of writers who are, who are sort of starting off things, thinking about writing graphic novels, which I think is like, which is a pretty new thing, like mainstream graphic novels, which I think is a new thing. I think too, we're seeing such a boom in children's graphic novels. Like, I think we've been beating down the door of like, kids deserve to have comic books that are not just retellings of like, we've dumbed down Spider-Man for you, here you go. But like real graphic novels that speak and talk to them. And so we've seen this like huge, like boom. Like it's such, people realize where the money is, right? And we're like, cool, there's a lot of money in kids' comic books. And I think we see this issue like on the banned book list, a lot of the reasons we end up getting banned books and banned graphic novels is it's called sexual content, um, unsuitable for age range. We were really talking about like, there's gay stuff in it, right? Like we don't want you to have that content. And as we see this rise in the kids comic book area, we're gonna find diverse stories that are being told about queer people and it's popular. So it's going to get in the hands of a bunch more kids, which means a bunch more parents are going to say, hey, maybe queer content isn't right for my kid. And it's probably not right for your kid or your kid. And so I don't want this book to be here. And this notion kind of of like, comic books are fine, but they're not real literature. We're seeing um, almost having to prove that it's real literature, that kids are devouring it, that the kids who read Raina are now growing up and they're going to read a bunch of other stuff um, and really focusing on this market. If we're not prepared to start talking to parents about why there's queer content in their second grade comic books, like I think we just really need to look at um, what I will assume is the rise of comic books being banned and challenged in schools and in libraries. And I think it's important too to reflect on on the history, the the stigma behind um, comics and graphic novels from you know the '50s with the decency crusades and um, the comic code and the fact that comics have been rendered as material 
um, what is it, subliterate material only for children. And so they haven't been able to evolve into a, a, a form of, of literature that adults can enjoy. So, you know, I was in my late 30s, um, sadly, when I read my first uh, graphic novel, and only because Seth was coming to speak at our conference, so I felt like I needed to have something to talk to him about. But um, it was the first time that I realized, oh, wait, this isn't just for children. I can't. So, you know, I think that now, if children have, um, this is my hope anyway, now as this generation is realizing that more of these issues are coming up in the graphic novels and in comics, my hope is that as they grow older, they're going to carry that with them. And more and more, it's going to be an art form, a, a form of literature that adults will find acceptable. And it's just going to evolve into a thing that, um, you know, broaches the, those necessary topics and, um, and isn't considered subliterate or, or something that's, you know, just for the kids who are too lazy to read the real stuff. Um, so hopefully, you know, that evolution will now continue um, as if we let it to, if we, if, we, if we allow it to evolve. Yeah, and I think on like a publisher level, like you can see, like when we did Skim in 2008 with Groundwood Books, which was like a children's book publisher, like the sort of, uh, you know, younger uh, literature imprint of, uh, ground, of um, Nancy, uh, like it was, it was a strange thing. Like we actually even had to like explain to them what diamond was. We were like, no one's going to read this comic if you don't, you know, use diamond. And Framwood was like, I, we were, we have a distributor. We were like, no, we really want this to be in comic book stores, right? Like it was this, there was this kind of divide between those two worlds. And now like Random House uh, with uh, Gina Gagliano has this huge like random graphics, right? Like this, this huge imprint that is going to be putting out like a massive number of, of graphic novels. And I think that, that those two worlds and to have like literary publishers promoting as part of their list graphic novels is going to make a, a huge difference to the, but to the point that you can now see publishers like DC Comics saying, we need to get into you know, young adult, middle grade graphic novels. And that they are like, it's like this like snake's tail thing where they're sort of like, oh no, we need to do what the publishers are doing and take people who are, you know, like a, um, Metcalf, who are Lauren Metcalf, who are better known as like YA writers and like bring them into, into graphic novels. One thing is um, absolutely, I think we're seeing as um, you ever, all of our panelists has touched on is definitely there's a rise in the popularity of comics, certainly maybe as Angela <laughs> forecasts and maybe a rise also in the bends and challenges. Um, and I think also noting that there is a very, if you will, storied history of comics. Um, for those of our listeners who aren't aware in Canada, comics were actually, crime comics were in the criminal code of Canada until 2018. So it was introduced actually in 1948 and it was consistent under the criminal code till 2018. Um, for people who are familiar with Frederick Wortham's Seduction of the Innocent, um, he actually used an incident in Canada. It's called the Dawson Creek Incident actually happened in British Columbia. Two boys um, actually shot um, a man driving on a highway and they were found to be influenced by crime comics and Wortham used this as inspiration for uh, the juvenile delinquency hearings in the U.S. which prompted the criminal code so the comics code in the U.S. So for anyone who's like ah there's no moral stigma I mean there's legit legislation for a very long time and a lot of pervasive attitudes that we've talked about in terms of like the good and the bad reading the class argument or even this, that they're less than. Um, one of the ways we tend to see this a lot too in uh, summer reading programs even, summer reading programs in Canada and in the US, you'll even hear about examples of kids have to read one comic for every real book that they read and that the comics are sort of considered less than in terms of the reading content. So I guess going forward, uh, we've touched on a little bit about this, but what are some things, we have a few questions in chat, but I was just wondering if we could just um, think about going forward, projecting for the next five or 10 years, given all the advances we've talked about with um, the publishing industry, what do you sort of foresee as the future for comics and intellectual freedom going forward for the new readers that are coming to them or the readers that are continuing to expand their readership? Um, I think one of the things, so definitely like follow where the money is going to go. And I feel like, of course, that'll rise in challenges. I think a piece we didn't really get to touch on, but um, is the rise in popularity as it's continued year after year of manga. And what does that look like as like a, a different take on cultural norms? Um, there was a library last year 
uh, that give out My Hero Academia, which if you don't know is one of the more popular mangas that are going around right now um, for their summer reading program. And you're like, cool, this is the most popular book. I'm super glad we're giving out graphic novels. This is wonderful, except on the cover, there's a scantily clad woman and it raised concerns from the librarians who were like, oh no, there's a butt. Like we can't give third graders a butt. And there's like no butts in the comic, like scantily clad women, okay. So they chose to put their summer reading sticker over her butt and in a way kind of censor what that was so that they could hand it out. And I'm like, cool, I think we've missed the point. Like, I, I think I'm still happy we're giving out manga, but there's this, the, the rise in manga and kids um, are reading it and devouring it. And it's not just, you know, otaku's in their basement, like, oh, give me the manga. It's, it's kids of every walk of life finding themselves in this different, um, different format that a lot of us don't understand sometimes. And what does that look like? So I think the rise of manga, we might see more challenges around that in our our schools and libraries. Um, I mean, I think to Michelle's point earlier, just in terms of like who is in these spaces, I think the thing that I'm really hoping will happen is that we'll see also more of a diversity in the publishing side of things and who is making the decisions, like who is, um, you know, as opposed to sort of doing this kind of fact checking like kind of outsourcing fact checking in terms of like sensitivity readers, like let's get like three people of color and a queer person to make sure this isn't offensive, that there is actually sort of more voices in the room from the get go that are diverse voices that are going into the decision of what to publish, that are going into the decision of how to promote these books. Um, and that I think will sort of, not just about, because I think, you know, I hope that as we move forward, we get sort of beyond the conversation of diversity and inclusion to like all the more sort of intricacies and the sort of like intersectionalities that are that are you know really a part of these stories that are and that are affecting people's lives. So I um, that was you know that's sort of a, a thing that I see starting to happen. And I think you know there's so many incredible like young people. I'm old now, so I see everybody like uh, younger than me as young. Uh, so. I see these new voices that are, you know, kind of coming up in the publishing business, especially in graphic novels, you know, very feisty people <laughs> who are very like driven and excited. And um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing like how that changes comics. Um, I think something that I'm fascinated to see how it progresses is just the fact that the youth uh, will not be silenced. And, you know, I have a house of seven year olds uh, yesterday and they're all they all want a YouTube channel and they all have something to say and it's all original and it's worth you hearing and you know I just I think that I certainly didn't have that confidence or wherewithal when I was young so I'm fascinated to see where that goes and you know how many authors maybe were breeding amongst them um, because they will not allow their stories not to be told and if they don't see themselves reflected then they're making their own you know there's like a resurrection of zines happening and and people putting together their their own um, their own work to reflect what they see around them. So I'm 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 um, encouraged by that, and I'm I'm fascinated to see where that's going to go because I have high hopes for them. Um, so before we're um, at a little under ten minutes, so we have time for probably a few more questions. But before we get to that, I just want to make sure we go through some of the Freedom to Read Week uh, resources that we have for all of our participants. Um, so we have some resources on Freedom to Read Week, including a link to the Freedom to Read kit. Um, there's a lot of different suggestions for educators, including how you can prompt um, discussions with your classroom around Freedom to Read Week. There's suggestions such as uh, band book, read a band book, um, have discussions around challenges. Um, as sort of an American Canadian, I think one of the most important discussions, not just in our profession, but in education, is also intellectual freedom in North America and the differences between freedom of speech in the US and freedom of expression in Canada. It's a very important legal difference that often gets minimized and flattened in these discussions. And it's something that should be a vigorous dialogue in our profession at all times and something that we do need to talk to 
students about that when we talk about legislation under that umbrella, there are differences between the US and Canada. Um, we've seen that impact sometimes publishing, especially for comics. Um, so this is definitely something, a good jumping off point. We also have a great timeline of Freedom to Read Week. So Freedom to Read Week started just two years after Ben Books Week in the States. And so Freedom to Read Week just celebrated their 35th year anniversary last year. There's a really fantastic timeline. It goes through a lot of landmark cases of Freedom to Read Week in Canada, as well as some larger issues around Freedom to Read Week and intellectual freedom in Canada and in the rest of the world. Um, please follow along all week long. One of the things we're super excited about through the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable is we will be continuing with some of our live stream. We're going to be uh, pulling up some of our archive webinars from Ben Books Week this past September. So we're going to be showcase showcasing those all week. Also, a huge thank you to our sponsors. Um, this is actually the first time that we're doing something like this in recent memory between the US and Canada under the umbrella of ALA. And we're super excited about it, um, like super excited. Um, so a huge thank you to the Book and Periodical Council of Canada, as well as Freedom to Read Week. Thank you so much, Michelle and Freedom of Expression Committee. Huge thank you, Angela and the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable. If you don't know, they're a fantastic partner. We also have super cool stickers that say, I read band comics. Um, we have t-shirts available. So. <laughs> um, also a huge shout out to the International Relations Roundtable. Um, they were an organizing partner for this and they're one of the most important voices in the discussion because when we talk about librarianship, we are an international profession. The ALA covers Canada, it covers Mexico, the United States and the Caribbean. And so when we talk about dialogues in the profession, it is an international discussion and we need many and more voices at the table. Um, we also have links uh, if you have our or encounter a challenge or a ban, we have a link to Freedom to Read has reporting and that form is actually open all year long as well. We have the link to the ALA, Office of Intellectual Freedom for reporting a challenge. I would highly encourage all Canadians who are listening in, please report both. It's really important that we monitor bans and challenges and really have a sense of why people are banning and challenging things and what kind of sort of feedback around titles we're hearing and also some tools for anybody. You're not alone. Um, most people who've worked in the profession have had bans or challenges. I kid you not, I had a book challenge during Ban Books Week one time in New York. It was pretty, I was like, good timing. <laughs> um, so um, before we finish up, I think we might have, we have about four minutes on the line. So a um, huge thank you, of, of course, to our panel. Um, but yeah, if we have a few more discussion points amongst our panelists, we have about four minutes left. Are there I any just wanna, <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say how excited I am to hear people saying about, because I'm living <laughs> in California. And I, it's just, I'm just loving that part of it. So I just needed to say that. <laughs> yeah, me and, uh, so I'm currently in Edmonton in Alberta. And so, <laughs> mm -hmm, yep, it's a very strong about. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. It's like, I'm loving it. <laughs> Um, let's see. I'm just going to go to our chat for one sec. Um, gonna go teach. So for everyone on the line um, who has watched along to our live stream, we'll also be archiving this content. It will be available at the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable YouTube channel. And I would also again urge you, we will be um, bringing up content that we had aired previously in September for Ben Books Week, and that was actually five days of webinars, and we talked about a lot of issues around intellectual freedom um, for Ben Books Week, including privatization and access actually in prison libraries. So there's five topics, five days of content. We're going to be replaying all of that this week as well for Freedom to Read Week, and hopefully we only had one webinar this week, but you know, maybe next year for Freedom to Read Week, we can actually have five days of webinars, five days of discussions, and maybe, Marika, to your point, maybe more abates and <laughs> more fantastic, wonderfully um, commingled Canadian-American accents talking about these topics because they are very important and um, I think for all of us who love comics it's sort of a hard discussion to have around intellectual freedom when sometimes even within our own profession people say things like oh skim that's a really nice title I'm not gonna read it uh, <laughs> um, I like to say when I come to work personal reading preferences aside I like to put on my professional hat and so I think we're working towards that that 
Um, Alia Perez, who is our president-elect for the Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable, said actually at a panel in San Diego, not everybody is a comics reader currently, but they can be. And I think especially within our profession, it's a professional duty to ensure we know um, titles that our communities are interested in and actually meet people where they are. So again, a huge thank you to our panelists, a um, huge thank you to the American Library Association, of course, for letting us take over their YouTube um, channel to live stream right now. And I think with one minute to go, we'll sign off um, unless I'm missing anything. I'm